Hi, everyone. I'm Greg Vasich. I'm the Associate Director with market research firm Strategy Analytics Global Automotive Practice. I've been with the company for about seven years as part of my remit at the company. I have covered automotive cybersecurity. My main areas of coverage include automotive infotainment, connectivity, and other areas such as um, increasing ECU consolidation, as uh, Joby mentioned in his opening uh, comments there. So there are a number of factors that are affecting the marketplace. And as uh, cybersecurity has become increasingly important over the last few years, this is an area we've paid more attention to. So today I'm going to be talking about a few different aspects of cybersecurity, um, and specifically how different challenges in the industry and things that are happening are affecting the environment. And of course, the ultimate goal here is to uh, find ways to work through these challenges as an industry work together. And I'm going to put a little bit of a plug in for Geneva, of course, to talk about just to reiterate what Joby talked about in terms of getting involved and participating and the importance of doing so. So to get started, I think everybody in the industry knows that the number of wireless, number of wireless connections in cars is increasing dramatically. This isn't news to anybody. The whole point of this slide is just to say, Look, the number of vehicles that have wireless connections, say Bluetooth, embedded cellular, Wi-Fi, it's going to increase not just a little bit over the last few years. We're going to be talking about hundreds of millions of vehicles. For example, you know, if you're talking about um, embedded cellular, you have 570 million vehicles that we're estimating will be shipping between 2018 and 2027. Bluetooth, 808 million. Um, cars with Wi-Fi, 520 million. So essentially, we're, we're talking about a highly connected environment. And that means more attack surfaces than ever. And of course, this means professionals in the field have to contend with this. This is news new to anybody. One of the major changes, things that's actually happening in the marketplace that is having a huge effect from the different suppliers I've talked to, and conversations I've had with others in the industry, specifically are around regulations. So of course, the, on June 25th, the UNECE, they adopted two new sets of regulations, part of the broader WP29 regulations. They include the UN regulation on cybersecurity and cybersecurity management systems and related the UN regulation on software updates and software update management systems. So for um, a lot of the other standards and other things that have come up in the industry, they don't necessarily, they've been more like standards or guidelines or best practices. And I'll mention those briefly. You can see the list of standards and whatnot on the right there. However, for the UNEC WP29 regulations, they apply to a number of countries around the world. The main ones that have said they're going to be, you know, putting these into force in the very near future include, of course, the, the European Union. Uh, that's supposed, as all new type approved vehicles as of July 2022, and of course, all new vehicles as of 20 July 2024 will have to abide by these regulations. Japan already adopted these for um, vehicles of SAE level three and above, which is not going to be a huge number depending on how you're classifying vehicles under the SAE uh, framework. Um, however, you know, it's the point is Japan also adopted this for over the year updates starting next month, starting in November. Korea said they plan to adopt this at some point in the future. There's no real clear timeline yet, but the bottom line is it's a lot of vehicles in a lot of major markets. Um, there are 54 different countries that are signatories to the 1958 UNC agreement, which means that, you know, you're, you're going to be talking of tens of millions of cars sold worldwide. They're going to have to meet these regulations. In terms of what the regulations actually cover, I'm not going to do a deep dive into it in this session, but essentially they require automakers to be doing threat analysis, testing, making sure that they're documenting all of this, and then post-sale, once vehicles are in the field, monitoring vehicles, and then mitigating any, any threats that they are aware of, and if any threats they are not aware of um, occur or any breaches happen, then you know being able to fix those. So this requires a whole different set of operations and ability capabilities on the part of automakers and suppliers in the industry. So in terms of other regulations and guidelines, as Joby mentioned, of course, ISO 21434, it's still, um, to my, my knowledge, in draft format, but getting close. That'll be a set of guidelines for processes. Of course, you also have a huge number of other different guidelines. If you're talking about privacy, you've got, of course, got GDPR in the European Union. In the United States, of course, there's California's CCPA. In terms of other standards themselves, of course, you got the SAE 3J3101 for hardware security. Autosar has a standard. Bottom line is it's a new environment in terms of standards and, of course, now more, more importantly, regulations people in the industry have to contend with. And it's going to be a really complex environment to do that. 
So overall, whoops, let me go back one. I clicked just one slide ahead. All right. So the industry faces a number of challenges related to this. Of course, compliance is the first big challenge. As you can tell, companies have a short time frame, short window that they're going to have to operate under in order to comply with these uh, regulations and, of course, to adopt standards and best practices. Because if you're going to have to comply with regulations, you want to be putting best practices in place. Another major challenge that I've heard uh, based on my conversations with people in the industry is specifically software asset tracking. The auto industry up to this point has not specifically had in place processes for tracking every piece of software, every, every, um, every piece of firmware, every piece of software running in every ECU and every car on the road today. That just has not been something that the auto industry has specifically focused on. There are companies out there, a pretty wide range, that are starting to offer solutions for this. Automakers, of course, are adopting their own processes. And even in Geneva has a project that I'll mention near the end of my presentation that specifically is designed to um, help, with, help with the compliance side. Um, in terms of operations, obviously, because the regulations uh, require monitoring and being able to deal with problems that crop up post-sale, this is going to require not only operational processes on the design side and development side, but also operational, like active operational processes that will allow automakers to manage any things that actually occur. Of course, one of the other major challenges we're facing in the industry that company there's an entire session about, as Joby mentioned, is next generations changing electrical architectures. Of course, the challenge the industry faces is that the industry has to balance current architectures, a lot of people refer to them as legacy architectures, and next generation architectures. Ideally, everybody would be able to just swap over to the new architecture that has many more capabilities in terms of storage, processing power, all the features, you know, hardware enabled security, all the features that everyone would love to have and security experts would love to work with. That's just not possible because in the meantime, automakers still need to sell cars. And, uh, and it's, it's expensive to switch over to a new, entirely new electrical architecture in a very short time frame. So to keep this cost effective, it's, it's going to be something that automakers are going to have to contend with. And these platforms, legacy platforms so-called, are going to be around for a number of years to come. So in light of these challenges, one of the things strategy analytics did is we worked with a company called Aurora Labs that asked us to do some survey work and specifically to survey not consumers and what they thought about cybersecurity related to cars, but what people in the industry actually think about issues related to software development, security, over the year updates. So the back one. So we developed this uh, survey and we fielded it over the summer. So July through August. And the people in who we actually talked to are people working in the industry. So 22% of respondents work for automakers, 21% uh, are uh, work for uh, tier one suppliers, 15% of semi vendors or semiconductor vendors, 15% are software companies in the industry. We did ask a few analysts as well. And then there are other people, of course, who didn't neatly fall into one of those, uh, working for one of those types of companies as well. But the bottom line, it was about 220 respondents. The idea was to find out what does the industry think of what's going on? What does the head of the industry feel about all of this? Also, just uh, so all of you know, we made this a report that has these, this data and much more uh, in detail available on our website for free. And after the event, I, of course, can anybody's interested, feel free to contact me and I can provide the link to Joby in, uh, in case anybody's interested in downloading that report. So the first question we asked is what percentage of vehicle software is going to be developed by mass market manufacturers themselves, as opposed to industry suppliers by 2025? Because one of the trends we're seeing in the market and keep hearing about is automakers want to do more of the software development work themselves. So obviously it's, it's a, pretty, a pretty wide range. Um, it, we, we're not at the point in the industry where automakers are saying, or anybody is saying that they're going to be doing the vast majority of software development work, but the trend is toward doing more of it in house. So 39%, you know, uh, of respondents said between 10 to 25, 5%. The one of the main things we are seeing, though, if you look at the slide in the lower left there, is that 76% of respondents said yes, they going they're, this percentage is going to increase over time. Automakers are interested in taking on more. This, to some degree, could be a response to uh, the need to control more of all of what's going into cars. As I mentioned, software asset management is a challenge. So the more that automakers directly control themselves, you know, the better the the better they may feel about being able to secure systems, integrate those systems, work with those systems. And there's still, of course, a huge opportunity for vendors uh, and suppliers in the industry because, you know, as mentioned, we're not talking about automakers doing all of the work themselves. It's, it's still a, a fair percentage is going to be handled by outside suppliers, of course. 
So, of course, one of the other major problems, and this leads is related to the last question, but also is um, uh, an issue is the number of different suppliers that are providing software, firmware in the different electronic control units in different cars. There was a pretty pretty broad mix of opinions as to the number of different suppliers that are offering their software uh, for different you know, for different different ECUs, uh, the the range though gets pretty high. If you look at 24% uh, of respondents said 25 to 40. Um, you have, of course, a smaller percentage, 25% assumed for the number of um, different uh, different suppliers offering code for high-end vehicle is only 10 to 25. But then, of course, you have 28% saying over 50 different suppliers. So the majority of people responding are saying minimum of about 25 suppliers are involved, uh, but there's a chunk that are saying over 50 suppliers are involved. That's a real challenge from an integration standpoint, given all the different code libraries, all the different types of firmware, every, everything that is in a car software-wise, and tracking all of that, understanding any possible vulnerabilities, and then being able to understand all the possible interactions among all these different software types of software from different vendors. So it's a concern, it's a challenge, it's something that the industry has to contend with and is going to have to work together to, especially, as, as Joby mentioned, collaboration is going to be more critical than ever because of the complex environment we find ourselves in. In terms of consolidation of electrical architectures, because this is a major, major change happening and is going to see much more diverse software running on, uh, say, a single type of ECU, say, for example, a cockpit domain controller or an ADAS domain controller. Um, and it, it potentially, we may in the future see so-called zonal controllers. We have much even greater consolidation of function. So we asked uh, respondents, when, when do you expect more than 1 million vehicles per year across the globe to be produced with more powerful domain-based controller architectures? And interestingly, it was, it was a pretty wide pretty right response in terms of um, when people think this is going to happen. So some people are saying car year model 2024, 26% of respondents said, yeah, they're seeing this shift in terms of a million cars with these more advanced architectures in just a few years. You know, we're, we're talking little three and a half, a little under, little less than three and a half years at this point. For car year model, uh, tw uh, and others, another significant chunk said 2027 or, and later. So the majority of people are thinking it's going to happen later. Interestingly, of the respondents, and there's more, like I said, there's more information about exactly how different of the groups we interviewed um, responded. 52% of, of a number of automaker respondents said they were probably the most polarized on the issue. They were the ones who said, oh, it's going to be 2024, or they're going to see later than 2027. This just goes back to my point about the legacy architectures that are going to be around for a number of years to come. We're not going to see a clean shift to new architectures in the very near term. It's going to be a, an industry with legacy architectures and, you know, uh, around for many, many years to come, as well as new architectures, you know, in the, uh, in, in the near future, in the next few years. Again, complex environment. People in the industry are, are kind of split on this, and we're going to have to contend with it as an industry. Okay, so for over the year updates, we asked a, a, previous, a question that I didn't bother to put here because the answer was so universal. But in terms of whether over the year updates are good, 98% of respondents said they allow automakers to add new features, they're ultimately a good thing. So nobody we talked to in the industry disagreed and said, no, over the year updates are the worst thing ever. Everybody thought they were a positive. From a security perspective, though, this, of course, means that securing over-the-air updates, making sure you're not causing problems when um, the problems aren't occurring, that it's not an avenue for attackers to get it, to cause mayhem or, uh, you know, cause all kinds of problems, you know, whatever it might be. This is something that where security is absolutely critical. And, of course, people in the industry thought that security was the most important aspect of this. Safety is tightly linked to security. It's going to be difficult to have a, a, a safe over-the-air update process if you don't have a secure over-the-air update process. So safety and security were the, were the top two. There was a, was a small percentage of people who said the user experience, zero downtime, is, is the most important thing to automakers. But the vast majority of respondents are saying, um, you know, safety and security. There was a chunk also that said cost. Uh, cost is always a factor in the auto industry, as I think we all know. But again, Safety, security, two most important things when it comes to over-the-air updates. In terms of regulations, and this was an interesting one. This was focused a little bit more on um, the over-the-air update site part of it in terms of the WP29 regulations. But as you can see, security is, is implicated here as well. 
And the question we asked was, do you think the newly adopted regulations um, you know, on software update management systems, is that going to accelerate development? And of course, of, of uh, over-the-air update systems beyond IVI, beyond, so all types of systems and cars can be updated. It's going to be ultimately be a good thing and allow not only updates to entertainment, but updates to the entire vehicle, which of course has really big implications for cybersecurity in terms of what you're able to fix, but also what you're going to have to be dealing with. And it was, it was mixed. However, most people, um, 40% said, yeah, regulating over the air update related uh, safety and security, that's going to make it easier. It's going to make it easier for us because we have a framework to work with to accelerate deployment of over the air updates. And of course, obviously, as we mentioned, security is critical to all of this. Uh, however, there was a chunk of people we talked to that weren't even aware of the new regulations. Likely these are individuals who were not um, working uh, for automakers, suppliers that are selling products into the markets that are affected by the new regulations. But the challenge we have is when you're talking about global automakers with global platforms, if they're selling into markets that are abiding by the new WP29 regulations, then they're going to have to be aware of the regulations and actively working to comply with them. So there's a bit of an awareness gap. Hopefully uh, this, this is something that the, the industry will again, work together to have a better understanding that these regulations exist and they're gonna be affected by them most likely, even if they're not wor you know, working for a, a company that's directly selling into those markets, there's a chance they're gonna have to, uh, be, they're gonna be affected by them and are going to have to be aware what they are and comply with them. So one of the, the, main, the main point behind all of this is that the industry is facing a huge number of challenges overall. In terms of regulations, we got the WP29 regulations. Right now, the sales environment is particularly challenging if you're looking at the state of the global economy. There are fewer vehicles selling due to COVID-19, current economic downturn. Sales forecasts for 2021 look a bit better. They start to do show some improvement next year, but obviously that's going to be dependent on how the economy, global economy performs and how what happens in major markets. Of course, there's a need to shift to electric powertrains to comply with emissions requirements. Of course, we have ADAS and autonomous driving development research ongoing. And of course, as I mentioned regarding over the air updates and just the number of wireless connections, we're moving to an environment where managing vehicle connectivity on a very large scale basis is going to be a significant